Do you want to blow up your fan base for cheap? It's very possible as long as you're willing to be a little unorthodox. And we're going to talk about how you can do that with ads today. And on top of that, we're going to talk about the simple thing that's making most of the music go viral today. We're also going to talk about some of the secret jobs of your favorite artist. In this episode, not only are we going to break down those topics, we're going to rapid fire through seven topics that artists need to know going forward. Check it out here on yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. Let's get it. All right, so for this first topic, music executive Ray Daniels breaks down the new way to build your team if you want to actually make more of your music go viral for the low. Check this out. Every song that's going viral is going viral because it's attached to a piece of content. If I was a label, I would hire a content house. I would try to make content every day, re uh, reappropriating content that matches our songs because you just never know. Like that Chris Brown Robitussin record, that came out five years ago yeah. and went number one three or four years later. All right. So let's just stop right there. All right. Content is the reason that most music goes viral. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say one thing, artists, right? Now, content does not mean the art does not matter. The music doesn't matter. We all know that the music does matter. Most of this is with the assumption that the music is good when we ha to have these talks. The thing is, it's about finding the right song and then pairing the right song with the right piece of content, mm -hmm. right? So it might take five, 10, 20 pieces to find that right piece of content for that song. But yes, it will then take off and go viral when the right song is paired with the right piece of content. That's all this really means. Doesn't mean the music doesn't matter. I don't want to make sure the artists get that part. Yeah, no, it's, he's saying the content is a conduit uh, to, to bringing the music to new people. The content a lot of times is the visualization of the emotions or certain aspects of the song that the artist may be trying to get across that they can't get across in their own content or, you know, maybe in a demographic where they can't create content for it. So, yeah, nah, he makes sense to me, man. Like, it's, and you know, even to the point he made, like, it, we all know content is a numbers game. If I can get 20 different content creators to make dope pieces of content in their own verticals to my music, you know, there's a good chance that one of these might take off. And and the good thing about it is my song is right there with it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It's all packaging, bro. Yeah. When you think about great content paired with the right song, it's like going to a Jamaican restaurant okay. and getting jerk chicken. Okay. That makes sense, right? Y yeah. But if I was at McDonald's, I don't want no jerk chicken at McDonald's, right? The song might okay. be the jerk chicken. <laughs> the content might be McDonald's, right? I want some fries at McDonald's. You say that for the French fry song, right? <laughs> You put the wrong thing at the wrong place, it's packaged, and it's like, ah, what's going on there? So that's how I kind of think about pairing the content with the song, right? The right dish at the right restaurant at the right time, and then it's going to hit. Somebody said, I don't know, this feels kind of destructive to the art, mm. tailoring your artist to fit the ideal needs of the internet for virality. See, he didn't say none of that. They, they're making all that up, mm -hmm. right? What he Basically, what he's saying is simple, all right? We know that content makes this thing pop. He said, hire a team, all right, for the label. That's a whole nother conversation whether I think the labels would be responsible and why I think they wouldn't necessarily do it unless it's more of maybe an indie, I don't even know that, maybe more of a management group. But, like, it's not destructive to the art because the art is already created. Exactly. Right? Then the content team goes and figures out what to do with it. So don't get that twisted. I think a lot of times y'all think, it has to be you create music specifically for the content. It doesn't. Otherwise, we would have to say music videos are anti-art and distracted, destructive. Or art. commercials or yeah. movie trailers or all these other things that need music to evoke the emotion. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It's just like. another way to express it. <laughs> Stop what you're doing. We got to interrupt you to let you know you can win $20,000 by submitting your music to two lost dot com slash collab for the crown we're looking for the best songs and we're partnering with two loss so if you think you got some great music if you think you got the goods go to that site two loss.com slash collab for the crown check out the instructions for the contest win up to twenty thousand dollars and make sure you put in no label when you create your profile on two loss so you can make sure you get three months completely free that's two loss.com slash collab for the crown. And again, when you sign up, put in the code no label, all one word, and you will get three months completely free. 
Go win that $20,000 cuz you know you got the goods, you got the talent. You just got to make sure you submit. Peace. Now, with that being said, the next topic, a music legend broke down what artists must do if they want to create legendary music and legendary fan bases. Check out this clip that was posted on Curtis King's IG page. I came across it um, on his page. Shout out to him from Carlos Santana, one of my favorite artists of all time, by the way. If you don't give yourself chills, no one else is going to get him, get them either. So you have to learn how to give yourself chills, you know, uh, before you hit that note. And then other people are going to get chills because if you don't get them, why should anybody? You know, it's important that a musician connects immediately with the heart. Otherwise, you lose them and then uh, they, they, they go somewhere else. Uh, it, it's not volume. It's not loud or, or anything. It's more like the intensity of uh, the, the intensity of your heart. Stop it right there. Your music should give you chills. Otherwise, how are you going to give somebody else chills? I love that he said that, right? And you need to be able to connect with it in that way. It's not that you can't manufacture some stuff, but mm -hmm. by a rule, you want to be able to rock with your own stuff. And that's the exact same thing that I tell people about content. Mm. It's like the visuals should be able to connect with you in some way that then connects with other people. And I always speak on that gap. If your music doesn't give you enough chills, right? Enough emotion where you can have a visual, like if you aren't inspired to create a visual from your own music, mm -hmm. how could you expect anybody else to be inspired to connect with it and visually see anything themselves? Yeah, I get that. Cause I've, I've had artists say things like, oh, listen to my song, it'll make you cry. And I'm like, I need proof. I need, I need a video that looks like it, it, it might match well with it. I need proof that somebody cried to it. I wanna see you cry to it, honestly. You know what I'm saying? Shed some <laughs> tears, look sad, something, you know? Um, but I don't, the only the point of contention I would have with this is like, at what point will we give grace and say like, like if I'm an artist, for example, in this scenario that made this really sad song, mm -hmm. I might cry like the first time I listen to it, but like, am I supposed to cry every time I listen to it? You know what I'm saying? No, no, I don't think <laughs> it has to do that. But like, it just, I think he's just saying it needs to come from someplace real, right? Mm -hmm. And then again, this is, if you're trying to really connect with somebody, now we're talking about longevity, not just the manufactured junk food music, because we know that can go. Yeah. Right. But if I'm going to connect with somebody for real and I'm going to be legendary to them. And that's what something I think artists should get today. Right. We talk a lot about virality music that goes and marketing, marketing yourself because we're just trying to help you get more attention and use music and the algorithms to get more attention. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you don't have to have a big fan base to be legendary. You could be legendary to one person. Yeah, like true. We all follow YouTubers and content yeah. creators that we rock with them enough that if we saw them, we'll be like, yo, I can't believe I saw them. And it'll mm -hmm. be somebody who's way bigger where you're like, I right, whatever. Right. Yeah. So it's like you could be legendary to one person and this is what it takes to be legendary to one person. So it's never ne about not doing the real music things that can be um, like connect with people and matter to people. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that. You know, again, you can become legendary overall. Shoot, you can build a, a fan base that shoot is legendary and funds your career as well. Yeah, yeah. I was just having a conversation with somebody about that. I was like, the fan brain, if you're someone that connected with, they see you no differently than how they see an artist that may be bigger than you, right? Like, if I love you and I love Drake, if I run into you, I'm going to probably react the same way I would react. As if I ran into Drake, yeah. because in my fan brain, I just know I love y'all. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like y'all are what? Are, like to your point, legendary. And I like you know that he talks about the intensity and everything, like you know, building the emotion. Because that's one of those things that like is hard to see unless you really keep up with an artist long term. Mm. Um, and then a lot of times too, you know, especially to your point with you know uh, viral music. Like if you don't go listen to their B sides, there are some artists that. You may feel like I'm making microwavable music, but then you listen to the, an album or EP, and you're like, no, he actually talking about some shit. Some and you'll there. see people outside the fan base be like, I don't get it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, how was this person that made this fucking dancey TikTok song got all these people going crazy? And it's like, yeah. bro, because he actually is talking about some shit. You just haven't made it past the initial entry point of like whatever the viral yeah, moment the or viral there, song yeah. was. Yeah, exactly. Let's see if he said a little bit more. If you don't give your... No, he didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> the intensity of the heart thing, one last thing I want to say with that is 
Um, it goes back to that conversation of simplicity versus complexity. And I always harp on that point that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. You got the curve. It's simple because you didn't put no thought into it. It gets complex and you think you're being so artful and people don't get it. But then the people who make it most simple are the ones who are most sophisticated. If they get to the other side of that fence and take the complex and make it simple, when it's sim when you take the complex and make it simple, it's intense, right? But you know what you mean? you know what you made me think about what? I don't know, but it's this it's one song that hits me to this day. It's a Whitney Houston song. Mm -hmm. What song? She's like, uh, I can't think of the name of the song, but where she's like, um, if six of y'all went out and four of y'all are really cheap, like, I don't know why, bro. Every, I gotta hear. It I, I can't remember the name of the song, but every time I hear that line, I'd be like, damn, bro, I feel like I just got caught up. You Say know the line again. Uh, if six of y'all went out and four of y'all are really cheap, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, just, no. yeah. uh, it's not okay. Oh, it's know, not man. right, yeah. but it's yeah. okay. Bro, oh, every yeah, time yeah, I yeah. hear that song and that headline, I be feeling like I got caught up. And it's such a simple, yes. simple line, bro. Like, yes. she's just saying, hey, I looked at the receipt. You said 60 y'all niggas went out. It's mm. only a, a bill for two. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No complex wordplay. Yeah. No vivid imagery. Well, I guess it's pretty vivid imagery. It is, but that's yeah, the point. Yeah, you're right. And that's yeah. the <laughs> intensity right there. Yeah. The imagery that came from somewhere. It was. It could have been complex. You could have said all this different stuff, yeah. but you said one simple line that meant the world. My yeah. my uh, song that I hear about that is funny because it's always like some breakup type stuff or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Chrisette Michelle got this song. Blame it on me. Say it's my fault. Say I'm a lie, I'm a cheat, say whatever you want, as long as it's over. Damn. That's what I said when I first heard that. <laughs> I said, damn. oh, she doesn't care. <laughs> and you be like, oh, you can talk all as crazy as you want, as long as we we done. I was like, oh, yeah, she threw through. Yeah, like, that's just <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we're talking about. When we talk about simplicity, we're not talking about bad music, the stuff that y'all think we're talking about. No. That's the first part. Oh, I don't got nothing going on for myself and I'm just throwing some simple. No, this is the other side where it's simple, but it means a lot. So intensity, <laughs> intensity, intensity. <laughs> that lot hit, though. That shit would, bro. That would fuck me up so bad. If somebody said to me, I'm like, damn, all right. <laughs> can't do that with that. Yeah, it's like, like damn, I, I can't gaslight no more. There's, no, there's nothing left here. Tell me to talk my shit. I don't even want to do that no more. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, let's get to a cheap ad strategy to blow yourself up. A little unorthodox. Most artists aren't rocking with it these days, but it still works. With Facebook and Instagram ads, and I'm talking five, ten thousand dollars a month on four countries, you can. People don't realize how global the world's getting. People don't understand how inexpensive this is. Like I went to Hong Kong, and by the third day, I'm like on a pedestal. America is still the number one brand in the world. Absolutely. America. The culture. Correct. Yeah. And so for you to just pick Indonesia mm -hmm. and fuck with it, run ads on all your little videos, play that music down, bang them, bang them, bang them. And now London, it's noisy. Or, That's what, you see where I'm going? That's why I'm like, pick Portugal. Pick, I mean, your, your foot. No and you know how much Philippines one. ads are? Three cents. <laughs> like you'll get everybody. And, and then all of a sudden, here's how it works, right? You got a hack. All right, so let's just stop here before the clip's over. The one thing I want to say is this strategy absolutely works. Mm -hmm. Y'all shouldn't be afraid of foreign countries because as we had Adrian Milani on the podcast a couple months ago, and he talked about how many of the R&B artists, especially, mm -hmm. that is the strategy that all the labels use. They'll break artists over in those markets get the algorithm going and then they'll break them in the u.s for those of y'all who are concerned about breaking in the u.s this is a typical route that many um labels actually use mm -hmm. start making that money get some momentum all that great stuff all right and on top of that yeah ads are still cheap in those other places yeah. they are still cheaper yeah, it's not changed man they, they, it, and it is interesting right like because what is this, this clip has to be from where like Five six years ago, yeah, he's talking to Nipsey, yeah. you know, and it's and it's so it's it's a minute ago, yeah, a minute ago, right? So one is just interesting to see that like that strategy hasn't changed since then, which says a lot about, I think, music culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, yes. it's just funny to see that like there were people like that telling this, and everyone still wants to chase the U.S., chase the U.K., like he said, and they want to start there. Mm -hmm. And this is goes back, and 
to artists hurting themselves with the initial dream that they have and only wanting the dream the way that they imagine. Yep. You oh, have yeah. to be willing, yeah. whether that's posting content or whether that's running ads and blowing up in a place you didn't know you were going to blow up first. Yep. You got to be willing to go through some things and do things you don't want to to get the thing that you want at the end and blow up and be the star that you want at the end, build a fan base. And the way this works is basically what he said. He said I was in Hong Kong probably run, running ads. Three days, I started to blow up. Well, maybe you can't spend 5 to 10 k but we have Adrian Milanio was spending $5 a day for mm -hmm. like three months and then added a campaign on top of that, blew up in Southeast Asia. Russ, right, was blowing up in Paris early on, mm -hmm. and he wasn't using that as, as much. It was, um, But YouTube and the content was naturally being attracted there, mm -hmm. and he was going over – uh, overseas. I always tell people the very first time, but well, the only time actually I met Russ, he wasn't a big artist or known yet and he was, I just had a real short conversation. I wanted to do like a little interview with him because I had a little series or whatever going on and he was like, oh yeah, I'm about to go to Paris in like next week or something real soon. And I was like, dang, because at that time you know, all the artists there, like nobody was like big in my mind. I was just like, yo, you're going to Perform in Paris, mm -hmm. you know that just sounded crazy for just you know, like at a basically just imagine like being at a college show type of vibes. Like we were, we were kind of fresh out of college. No, college wasn't even done yet, so it was kind of like that time. It's like, dang, you going to Paris? That sounded crazy and big to me. Mm -hmm. Going overseas, and that is very possible. Ryan Leslie, when I had the conversation with Ryan Leslie, his whole strategy, especially Europe in general, and I think especially Germany for a while, he was blowing up there, giving them more mm -hmm. attention than other people were. Right, exporting the brand because he said uh, uh, other artists in America don't show the love to those countries, so yes. they felt extra love yes. from him and appreciated him even more because he was showing love that big artists wouldn't. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it's a very real thing, man. I think one whenever I hear artists downplay the international strategy, it always feels like you can you can see their xenophobia kind of shining through. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It starts yeah, he going there. No, nah, I mean you know I've had some conversations. I'm like, oh. No, man, it's a, little, it's a little racist, bro. Like, you know, <laughs> that you don't want to work yourself in, in XYZ places. And to the point you made earlier, right, where so many new artists, and we've said this before, you guys play by rules that don't really make sense for you, right? Because the mm -hmm. only ever conversation I've had where the international marketing thing didn't make sense was when, you know, the artist is really wanting to maximize, like, streaming royalty, right? It's like, yeah. you know, that's a real thing. There are certain countries that pay out more per stream, you know what I'm saying, than, than other places. So if you are playing the streaming game, then, you know, being sometimes intentional about, uh, being more intentional about certain places does come into play. Now, if you're playing the build a community and sell shit game, then people are people at that point, you know what I'm yes. saying? <laughs> like yes. the, the, the dollar, can, I don't care if it's a euro, a peso, or USD, Thanks. as long as that shit hit the bank account. It's gonna feel the same. You know what I'm saying? So it, I don't know. And just even before we move out of this, I would encourage people listening to this, watching this to go check out um this article that Chartmetric did called Trigger Cities, like a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. You remember that? Yep. Yeah. Really, really dope. You know what I'm saying? Take as as the, the go alongside like you know what's being shown in this video to kind of like put you in that space. But yeah, bro, like the international marketing. Strategy is one of the deep dark secrets of the music industry. <laughs> Let me pop this motherfucker off in Mexico and make him look lit in the USA. And you know, most fans don't go research into where the numbers are coming from. So we know eventually people gonna just believe like they popping in wherever they seem to be, you know, staking their home base up. That's it. That's it. It's like getting bot streams except they're real people. Exactly. Like which is and, good. <laughs> which is actually great, but even before we move out there, brother, that I will always make that argument with artists like really early in my career. Now I don't care, man. Y'all do what y'all want to do. But I'd be like, bro, like, why get bots when like Gary V said, bro, you can hit motherfuckers in Indonesia for like point oh oh one cents. And it's like, yeah, it's not you know, the the streaming is gonna isn't gonna pay well, but at least it's a real fucking person. A real you know person. <laughs> like, and you don't gotta worry about Spotify taking it down. Exactly. But let's play the rest of what he said too real quick. Hack, hack attention, hack attention. Nobody owns Peru. And now somebody will be like, well, Peru, but you don't realize like, then like you you go find some artists there and put them on heat. Like there's so much of that. That's a 10 second in between like you're kind of like clicking everybody's stories and then you'll pop. And then with you, like you should be like, yeah, like, oh, yeah, you know what's funny? You know what's funny? 
you, you should actually do exactly what the fuck you did when you were slinging your shit at the beginning and be like, yo, swipe Barbara up, listen, if you don't like it, fuck, that's it. Yeah. You should it's fucking read. So, I love the word, the fact <laughs> that he said, you know, hack, 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 and you mentioned, yeah, you can even bring in an artist over in that country to mm-hmm. be on your music, do little remixes, all these types of things, because this is something that um, I've talked about with artists when breaking them in other spaces. You still have to do the things that it takes to break an artist, mm-hmm. even when you do it in other places. It's not just ads, right? Now, if you, once you start taking over with ads, then you have to still do the other things, which we could talk about in a whole other video, what that looks like or, um, or some other space. But like, that is still a part of it. If you really, really want to start taking off, ads can do wonders just alone, mm-hmm. but you can really plant your seed in another uh, marketplace and get money. And I know the struggle and the the imagination sometimes feels limited where artists might say, but I can't get over there. That's too far. But again, I saw Russ do it as an early artist. We talk about what Adrian's doing right now. We talk about, like I said, Ryan Leslie, just the names I mentioned alone, and they're not the only ones, mm-hmm. right? It, shout out to Quentin, bro. Quentin be going to- um, Oh, yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> Quentin Moore, yeah, he be in, in, um, in, he in, in East Europe, yeah. in countries that I don't even, I've never even heard of <laughs> performing, and they love him over there, and you will, you will get paid for those performances, all right? So it's very possible. You kind of just have to remove that veil and that limitation in your mind, thinking that, oh, it's going to be hard. If you want, part of being an artist, and grow, especially indie, there's some roughing it or doing things you didn't necessarily plan for, but we're talking about people being real fans, paying Mm-hmm. Come on, like you, Word you, mouth. you can't hate on that. Man. And and even on the point to um like the the getting over there, you know what what I've seen with artists as they start to build international fan bases versus their domestic fan base. All right, yeah. so I don't want to make it a USA thing because this applies to artists no matter where they live. Really, right? They all kind of experience the same thing. The people that are in your home city, state, country, sometimes it's hard for them to believe the character because they can see you in real life. Mm. It's hard for me to believe that brand man Sean is Sean. And I know I be seeing Sean Taylor at the gas station, you know what I'm saying, once a week picking up Skittles. Yeah. But this person in Peru, this person in South Africa, this person in wherever, they don't have as much access to you to see you. Yeah. So they they're um, you know, for lack of a better word, more gullible to fall for like whatever the character and images that you're trying to build, which is very important in early stages it's a lot of, easier. of branding. Yeah. Exactly. A lot easier. Fact, and they go harder for you and try to sometimes even help you get the resources to come to them because to Gary V's point, they're so used to artists in these bigger countries, especially the U.S., not even paying attention to them. So if I'm a music fan in Peru and I'm fucking with this rapper from Atlanta and the rapper from Atlanta is like, man, I would love to come to Peru, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. Bro, you'd be surprised at the things that fans will start telling you and the information they'll start giving you oh, and, yeah. and the resources they'll, they'll help you pull together in the name of just getting you out there, you know what I'm saying? Because yep. they want to see you and they feel like, they feel to a degree like, hey, if I don't help this artist, especially at whatever stage you're at, I may never get to see them. And it's not like people like you are coming through here a lot anyway versus mm-hmm. like the U.S., we're bougie, bro. We get artists of all types and genres that come through all the time. So we don't give a fuck if you come here or not. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's like, there'll be 10 more U's in your demographic coming through. So Bruh. it's just something to think about. For sure. I remember the first artist I helped do that. Um, he built a come to the U.S. No, nah, he no go. go oh, okay, to, okay, um, okay. And he was ends up crowd serving in Bank Bangladesh at this huge event that he got brought out to. And it was just amazing to see the real world translation of an international audience. Yep. But check this out, you guys. We're going to talk about some of the secret jobs of your favorite artists. All right. We posted on our page. If y'all aren't following No Labels Necessary on Instagram, y'all make sure y'all do that. No labels necessary. That's it. No no added stuff. No official. Just follow that. But <laughs> the post was titled Nine to Five Jobs Before They Were Famous. So just as a little inspiration, John Legend was a management consultant. Crazy. John Legend was getting a bag. And he was getting a bag. So he <laughs> took a risk for that artistic career, which just actually makes things make more sense. When we think about some of the clients we had, we're like, man, you an engineer? You a lawyer? Yeah. Man, you still want to do this music? J. Cole was an ad salesman. Probably the most surprising one on the list. Yeah. We're not going to troll and throw this Beyonce post in there. <laughs> they were. <laughs> we're going to leave that one out, this combo. Tyler, the creator, was a Starbucks barista. Makes sense. I can see that. I can definitely see that. 
Pharrell was a McDonald's crew member. I did not know he was at Mac, uh, McDonald's. I can see that. I always forget about like young, slightly hood Pharrell. You know, he's just so different now that I forget that he yeah, had that phase yeah, in life. Oh man, that's because <laughs> Richmond hood can look different from the rest like, of the world through yeah. the screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, like it, it might not translate sometimes until you, unless you really know what it's like. Nicki Minaj was a Red Lobster waitress, which that. that is crazy fitting. Yeah, I can see that. That yeah. is crazy fitting. <laughs> Wait, is that a real picture of her in a uniform? Is that Bro, I was thinking about that. I'm like, no, that her face looks like current her, but the you, the outfit looks like she really at Red Lobster. So I don't know. Did EJ, you Photoshop this or something? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's definitely fitting. <laughs> it's definitely fitting. And then Kid Cudi was an American Apparel associate. I could definitely see that. Yeah, I remember he used to talk about it a lot when he was coming up. I remember he used to talk about it a lot. Who else we got? Kanye was a Gap sales assistant. He's already leveraged that narrative. Yep. Shout out to Spaceships. So, again, if you want to see posts like that, follow No Labels Necessary, y'all, on Instagram. But hopefully it's a little bit of inspiration where you start is not where you have to finish. And in further news, Spotify and TikTok, they made a little a little feature advancement that can 10x the quality of TikTok for artists for sure. Spotify will now let you save songs from TikTok to your library directly just giving you a little info. Spotify will let you save songs from TikTok to your library. Mm -hmm. As in, I'm scrolling TikTok right now. I see a song. I can save it in my library without leaving my TikTok experience. Everything's connected. That impact for people to be able to make impulse saves. That's basically what it is, yep. right? Yep. Without having to go through all these barriers, go over to Spotify. When I say that's going to be huge for artists, right? To begin to have that addition and that, um, and it's going to increase the the, the uh, impact of content, especially, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Whether you ask somebody directly, hey, you know, if you like this song, go ahead and save it, and you tie that type of narrative, and you do a, a call to action within your uh, your content, that's going to hit a lot harder, mm -hmm. right? Whether you just do a song and it's popping. And people are like, oh my gosh, is this out already? I would love if that save could like be somewhere visually where people don't have to wonder if the song out is already. Cause that's always weird. Where yeah. it's like, why do people still do that so much? When it's like, oh, you gotta do, you can see the sound, you can click the sound and see that it's out. Yeah, but it's there. Yeah. Like this is going to be um, like this is something that if you are not using TikTok now, and inevitably we know it's gonna happen on Instagram, Instagram is already making these. Um, you know, feature enhancements with mm -hmm. Spotify. Like, this is just more reason to create content. Period. Yeah, and it's like, man, you know, as a as a Spotify user, it's it's nice to finally be able to play the game that Apple Music users have been playing for the last three, yes. four years. Um, yes. so those of you with Apple I probably don't care because y'all have been able to do this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to your point, man, you know. Like I said, speaking from it from the Spotify user side, there's definitely been times where I found songs on Spotify that I liked. And I was like, man, do I really feel like swiping out the app right now? You know what I'm saying? Right. Going to add this to my library. Not really. Here's the way to think about it. Think about how many times you see mm -hmm. songs that you like within some content that you like and you click like or you save the video so you can go back to it later. Oh, and find it. Yeah. yeah now facts, all yeah. you got to do is Quit save tap, it. Tap, tap, tap. Straight to Spotify. Yeah. Which then lessens the barrier of, oh, I'm on Spotify now. Oh, dang. I got to go back to TikTok to then figure out what those songs were. But those saves are going to be mixed in with all my other random content saves, my cake recipe. All right. Now, now it's straight on Spotify. So next time I'm on Spotify, I could just go look at my my last save TikToks. Yeah. And you're like, where did I get this one from? Oh, yeah. From that. You know, meme on TikTok, I found some shit. Yeah. Exactly. Smooth yeah. experience. I think that's going to be beautiful for artists if we just think about less friction. Straight up. Now, on the other end, if y'all didn't see this, Snoop Dogg announced that he was giving up smoking. Crazy. All right? And he, the world was in a frenzy. It was a whole finesse. We're going to talk about for the, fin uh, the finesse. But the initial uh, post said, after much consideration and conversation with my family, I've decided to give up smoke. Please respect my privacy at this time. Now, 
Mm, the yeah. please respect my privacy at this time was yeah, like that's crazy. It was like extra dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> but then Snoop Dogg being as connected with smoking as he is, is like, all right, well, so there's something going on because why would Snoop Dogg stop posting, right? Obviously, people are congratulating him, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but <laughs> but the whole thing ended up being a sham, just a finesse, so he could promote a smoker. Of course, it went viral. I'm going to play the clip, and we're going to talk. There's a reason that we're talking about this. We're not you know, getting any affiliate deals up off of this. Not yet, We, we should. Yeah, not, not yet. I have an announcement. <laughs> I'm giving up smoke. I know what you're thinking. Snoop, smoke is kind of your whole thing. But I'm done with it. Done with the coughing and my clothes smelling all sticky icky. I'm going smokeless. Solo stove fixed fire. They took out the smoke. Clever. And actually, is this a smoker or more of a um like a fire pit type vibe. Yeah, it was like a fire pit. More of a fire pit type vibe. Cause, right? cause I just caught it. Well, I caught it as you was reading it. I didn't want to, you know, spoil the surprise for mm -hmm. people listening. But he didn't say in the post I was giving a smoking. He said I'm giving a smoke. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But you already know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was weird too when I read it too. I was like, smoke. <laughs> I was like, all right. But you already know what's going to happen. And the power of this, this goes to show the power of brand identity. Yes. Because so many people could have said that. And people will always feel a way about the topic of smoking one way or another. That'll generate some type of conversation. But it being Snoop Dogg and so mm -hmm. attached to his brand allowed him to be able to pull off this campaign in a way that nobody else could have. Yeah, bro. Like you said, there's people congratulating him. You know what I'm saying? People yeah. people treated it like a real ordeal. When I first saw it, I thought something happened. I was like, why are so many people talking about Snoop like right now? You know, exactly. so. Yeah, to your point, there's a lot of artists who have found ways to incorporate weed and smoking into their brand. None, of course, to the degree as Snoop. I mean, the only other person that maybe could have pulled off is Wiz Khalifa. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That's the only other artist I think could have maybe had a similar effect on it. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. yeah, no, this this whole thing was genius. I ain't even gonna lie. Like, you know, like I said, man, we can get that sponsorship, man. I'm gonna try it out, review it on the pod. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and this is the beauty <laughs> of a strong brand identity and building yep. up that reputation because for a different artist, it could be something else. The I idea is you now have an inside joke or an inside language and representation with your base. Yeah. Right. Whatever that looks like. And it's important to kind of think about that as you begin to build and create that relationship with your audience. What yeah. does tie y'all together? What might be a little bit more taboo that the rest of the world doesn't rock with that ties y'all together? And then what are some of the more common universal things that, that tie y'all together? Because then once you're aware of that, you can know where the nerves are. Yeah. And then you can touch those nerves. Yeah. Right? And just like a game of, uh, what is it, doctor or something? What's the thing? I just, I, uh I was about to say, guess no, who, crazy. The nose is going to buzz. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. The surgery game. Yeah, the surgery game, right? Just like that game. You know, all right, you touch your nerve, buzz off. And then now the world is talking about it with you doing little work. Because now everybody's like, oh, did you see this? It's like, don't even super care. But it like, it's still like, oh, that's crazy. Like Snoop Dogg is, is quitting smoking. Don't feel one way or another, but still just like a little bit of mm -hmm. random like water cooler talk. Yeah. So that is something that, again, it should be a spot you should aspire to. All right, create that relationship with your audience, whatever that thing will be for you or those things. Yeah, it makes me too think about uh, when Lil Yachty gave up the red hair. Like that was kind of like a big deal in his mm -hmm. fan base, right? Because it, it was. He was using it to symbolize the growth from like child, you know what I'm saying, to adult and the new brand that came from it. So it's like, yeah, it don't even have to be something that is, is um, big necessarily is like a smoking or a habit that you I'm glad you, know, you did you said that because so people could realize yeah, how small it might be because mm -hmm. another example when you talk about hair was actually Justin Bieber he was a child uh, star I forgot about that. and he had that bowl cut yeah. or whatever that yeah. you know all the boys in his age bracket and demographic started to get and then when he cut his hair it was a big deal mm -hmm. with his fan base those small things whatever they begin to know you for whatever that thing is can then be used for another attention grabber yep. or marketing deals, whatever. Yep, yep. And his last topic, Kirk Franklin is really a musical genius and he doesn't even sing. That is the title of his post. 
I'm going to just play a little bit of this. And then we got a question for y'all. a couple of clips of Kirk directing the choir mm-hmm. right them singing we're not gonna even go through all of it because it's all something similar actually this particular combo is not one that I saw coming but it feels so right that it's happened right now you know Kirk I've been a mad fan of for so many years he's an absolute like, living legend for everyone who's listening who knows Kirk Kirk Franken is like a gospel music he's like a giant. titan he's, a giant. he's the guy alright that's the part that I think it's important to play that people see him this way. And again, as the title says, he is a really a musical genius and he doesn't even sing. And the reason I think that's important is because one, we have a lot of producers that might follow us and they're trying to be acknowledged more as a producer versus a beat maker. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to orchestrate something and even artists themselves. There's so many different ways to, have musical talent, musical ear. Like I know when they talk about Michael Jackson versus Prince, they're like, Prince played 27 instruments. It's like, ah, but yeah, Michael Jackson, yes, he didn't play 27 instruments, but you can't say he didn't have any musical talent like the way he would like be beatboxing or be able to produce and create beats in his head and communicate. However, your talent comes into fruition, like the way you interpret it, Mm -hmm. you can make it shake, all right? You can make an impact with it. And I think sometimes artists even get limited in the idea of what an artist is. And I hate that the most because it's just like, y'all of anybody. <laughs> supposed to get it. Yeah, are supposed to get it. Like you can't put the art in the box. And so you shouldn't be saying this is real art or, 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 or not real art. You really don't know because you don't know where it came from. All right. But two, again, there's having a vision and Pulling pieces together mm-hmm. doesn't lessen your talent if Jacory is the person who draws, right? And then Sharante is like doing the 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 color and all that and, and the blocks and the texture. But I was the one who came up with like what the silhouette was, or I told y'all to like tweak, tweak, tweak here. And it's a part of maybe bringing my vision to life. The way like pop culture does and the unknowing. Fans will minimize things and say, oh, well, Sean, you didn't do anything, Mm -hmm. right? But the reality is sometimes you're an artist and your tool is the paintbrush. It is the beat pad. It is the, the pencil. But sometimes you're an artist and the people are the tools. I knew you was about to say that. Of course, because it's the truth. Yeah, but it just sounds crazy. Like it sound, I know <laughs> for you, I know it sounds crazy to some people, right? But it's no different than um, Steve Jobs saying, I don't play an instrument, I play the orchestra. Mm. All right, I'm a conductor. Y'all are playing the cello. Like that guy at the front, which is what Kirk is, mm-hmm. He's putting out emotions, inspiring, creating energy, doing other things that are an art and producing in different ways. And I always encourage artists to bring all of that to the forefront because that's also what's going to differentiate you versus just creating music or um, art in general. Yeah. All right. In the yeah. way that other people define art. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I don't think it's respected enough how much. Um how artistic guiding, managing, and directing creative talent is. You know what yes. I'm saying? Like, that is an art form in itself. Like, I know yes. lots of people who could be in a room full of other talented people and, mm-hmm. and not know what to do with them. Exactly. I know talented people that don't know what to do until other people tell them how to use their talent. You know a lot of good spices in the cabinet. That don't mean you know how to cook with them. Yeah, bro. If you ain't nobody shaking them in the bowl, then, you know, ginger just ginger, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. But, so, Cause one, I, I really have looked at like Kirk Franklin is basically like the gospel of Kanye. You know what I'm saying? Like in 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 that sense, I think that's a fair comparison. Mm, you know? Kanye is more the rap Kirk. If we want to go that direction, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Got to respect the the chronic Who was chronology. First? Kirk Franklin was there first on Earth or in music? In music, bro. What you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Kirk was in was first in both. <laughs> Kirk was popping in the nineties, man. Oh yeah, you right. Yeah, Damn. All right, man. Y'all can mean? y'all can ignore that question. That, that, that was that was sound crazy. Then I kind of think about it aloud. But 
your but, purse. <laughs> but I like to see, I like to see the directors of talent get more love in music, and I like to see mm -hmm. it be regarded as an artistic skill because I think that you know, the creators, the artists that do, you know, to your point, something where the thing that produces directly tied to the art. You know, y'all love to get on y'all high horse and, and act like y'all mm -hmm. are the only ones that matter, that get yep. to have an opinion, mm -hmm. that were the most integral part of the whole creation process. And, you know, stories like Kirk, stories like Kanye, stories like, you know, um, the Pharrells and, you know, they even, you know, other, there's a lot of examples of this. A point, lot of you know them. In, in his Jobs, I, I talk yeah, about Steve him. He Jobs, was seen yeah. as, a, a, as more of a creative CEO, a visionary, and I always feel like artist. Right, you should be a visionary at the mm -hmm. highest scale. Every artist is a visionary. The skills are not the symbol of the greatest artist that we acknowledge. Skills are their skills. There's something you yeah. learn, you train, and you gain. But the vision in which you apply those skills yep. is what makes you an artist. It's your point of view. There's a lot of people who can like draw, and but and they could. They can look at something directly. I can look at your face and I could draw your face and look and make it look super, super accurate. Mm -hmm. Right. And I might not be able to do that myself. But the way I see something and innovate and put things together can be way, way more creative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we think the technical parts uh, in executing music or art is what makes an artist. That is not true. But I use that example as well as of Kanye. I was talking less about the music. I actually, when I said the art, with, with the art and drawing and painting, a lot of it, I was thinking about Kanye too. Because mm. when it comes to fashion, he can't do a lot of the things in terms of a technical aspect, but he knows how to direct people, mm -hmm. bring the Virgils around, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can't even think about I was trying to think about other, other buddies, Fear of God, like bringing all these people around, producing his team on Donda and getting in a room, right? Having that think tank. And coming out with something great and being the the visionary that creates the guardrails of what the outcome is. Yep. And that's just fine. Some of y'all have these creative aspirations and you feel like, oh, I don't have the time or I can't be as good as that. I remember when Kanye went to Timberland and was like, I can't do drums. I, I need these drums fixed. And he went to, I think, Pharrell and all these folks because he was competing with Tim and he didn't want to have to go to Tim. He was like, dang, I went through all these people and it wasn't right. And I got to go back to you. I, I went to Tim and Tim immediately knew how to fix it. I forgot what song that was. And and that, um, you know, the song became the song. I think it was Gold Digger, actually. But, like, the point is, again, that's him knowing the tools and knowing that there's an outcome of this song and even trying to go away from the tool, trying to do a little something different, right? But it's like, all right, well, let me use Timbaland's skill set. Mm -hmm. And Timbaland's Musically, as an artist himself. Mm -hmm. However, in collaboration, you can use other artist skills. That's how you build the best shit, bro. But yeah, hundred percent. But like, this is a. First of all, I think this is an amazing flip of a Kirk Franklin topic. <laughs> like, I, I just want to acknowledge that. I, I, I who, hope y'all would have thought, man. <laughs> who would have thought? I, I hope y'all appreciate that. Like, can we acknowledge the title real quick, bro? Because I thought Kirk Franklin was considered a, a singer to some degree this whole time. Yeah, let's end with that. Yeah, let's end with that, please. Do y'all consider Kirk Franklin to be a singer? Because I, BZ, are you with me? Oh, yeah. See, you're singing it more than Kirk sings it. No, nah, bro, he's. Kirk says it. <laughs> GP, are you with me? Oh, yeah. There's some melody to it, bro. It's chanting. Yeah, of course, there's a little melody, so <laughs> to speak, the call and response. First of all, I super appreciate Kirk for that, like normalizing that in oh, the yeah, 90s. Facts, yeah. it's like, it makes it so easy to learn songs and participate. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. You can enjoy anything. Man, and I feel like he was singing on that song with Lil Baby. I don't even remember that song, to be real. But Kirk wanted to be a rapper first, by the way. Makes sense. And that was why that. he was able to innovate in the gospel space, because he yeah. took that inspiration from that space and brought that energy to gospel when people actually um, fought against that. You know, that's like, yeah. oh, that's that secular music, bro. You talking yeah. about bringing the funkadelics to gospel? If y'all don't really understand and know the funkadelics, bro, bringing them into gospel, that's that's a whole another conversation. Y'all research the, the, the funkadelics. <laughs> it's a lot. They were they were wilder. I always look <laughs> groups like them 
and even the princes and a lot of these people early on, like these people are way wilder than we think we're wild now. Yeah, right. <laughs> they could get away with shit, bro. Like, and they could get and yeah, they could get away with get stuff. Get away with shit, bro. And plus, this is a I want to like end you know, on at least my talks for this, but I feel like the originals. A lot of times when I see stuff today, it feels like. In the beginning of the spectrum, we look go 50s to 80s. They were establishing and building, right? They were creating. And a lot of people today are just cosplaying. Mm. Okay. That's a, that's a spicy take, man. I'm just saying. It's like a, they're artists a, who were inspired by these artists and now they're trying to uh, represent yeah. and be those artists. Bring some type of energy from it. Go back. Yeah, you're right, man, because it's interesting how popular nostalgia is. It is, in exactly. Our, in our culture now. Yeah. That's what we're doing from yeah. a marketing standpoint. It's funny because Gary Vee would be talking about that all the time from a like, I'm going to bring Abercrombie and Fitch back or Banana Republic, these brands mm. that still have value. And people are doing that artistically as well, which kind of speaks to some of the you know, pain in, in terms of the missing um, nature of like a, the, the missing originality. And we're seeing it in movies. We're actually, nostalgia, everything, like you said, bro. it's all back. It's everything, bro. We got to stop it. We got to stop it because artists aren't supposed to be cosplaying, I mean, they, Not developed artists. They took is. all the good ideas, man. Like they had, they, you know, they just. They had a blank slate. Exactly, bro. Yeah. I was just about to say a blank slate, you know, blessing of being born first. You know what I'm saying? You know, like 30, 40, 50 year head start. It Kirk took all Franklin, the good melodies, all the good words. You know what I'm saying? All the good phrases. Like, what else can what else can we do? That, that's a fact. That's <laughs> a fact. It is what it is. <laughs> and that's it for this episode of No Labels Necessary. Hope y'all enjoy that episode. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace. <laughs>